in line with the sacred divine and drop the knowledge that you wanted beyond space and time. 35-year-old Jake Emlin is stood rapping verses at a street corner in central London. No hip-hop essentials. Name a boy with bad skill might be a spiritual guy. White, five foot eight, with thinning blonde locks, covered with a baseball cap. He weaves his poetic words together, eyes closed, as a small crowd packs tightly around him. There's not a real spitter, no pacifist on here, I'm a killer. You might need to pray to the Lord to appear at a pillar. Out dropping bars like this is normal for Jake, but what makes him extraordinary is that he's a Hare Krishna devotee. And although Hare Krishnas have this long tradition of singing and dancing out in public, he does things differently because he does it alone and he does it through rap. His words completely inspired by his faith. If your chakras aren't aligned, don't bother rapping a line. I run the microcosmic orbit round the back to my spine. Intertwine my mind in line with the sacred divine and drop the knowledge that you wanted beyond space and time. This is the documentary on the BBC World Service. I'm Rajiv Gupta, and for this week's Heart and Soul, which looks at personal stories of faith from around the world, I'm in London, spending time with the world's number one Hare Krishna rapper, Jake Emlyn. But I'm destroying rappers still. In this program, we'll hear how a life-changing event led Jake from atheism to preacher and to shun the opportunity of a massive music deal. I completely changed base. I went from pop star wearing a fur coat <laughs> to a uh, guy wearing robes, you know. But 10 years on, why is he now questioning his path in life all over again? Am I pretending, you know, um, I, I, I've got to get back out into the world as well. Yeah, just doing my vocal warm-ups, I do this every time. I know it sounds kind of funny, I always try and find a quiet space, I get self-conscious about doing it, but got to do these warm-ups, I learned that years ago. Especially when you do a few gigs in a row, actually this week I'm doing three. It's early September and this is a particularly busy time for Jake. It's the run-up to the festival of Janmashtami, which celebrates the birthday of the Lord Krishna. The Hare Krishna movement is sometimes considered as a strand of the Hindu religion that identifies Krishna as the central figure of God, as opposed to conventional Hinduism which can revere several depictions of God. Jake's biggest audience comes from within the millions of Hare Krishna devotees from around the world who have taken to his unique style. Well I'm actually taking different traditions and merging them. The tradition in hip-hop is conscious actually in the origins of hip-hop conscious lyrics but also some competition there so it's a little bit battle rapping but I'm also uh, because I'm being a, a Krishna conscious rapper I, I'm putting the traditions of Krishna consciousness in there so I'm making sure the lyrics are tight philosophically and correct and I'm just trying to keep the traditions though of hip-hop also like if you're gonna rap you got to also keep to those standards like you're supposed to display good syllables and flows and so I kind of did this merge of like uh, you know uh, come and challenge me I'm a good rapper but in a way where it's like asking the ignorant rappers out there. So I'm saying, you know, I'm challenging you to come with some more intelligent things. That's what my mission is, to raise the consciousness of every listener because we don't want to hear that nonsense. Shush, you're sounding stupid. I want to hear what... You're holding a lot of responsibility as well because you're not only a music artist, but you're representing a community and, and a very tight-knit group of religious people. Yeah, so I have to make sure in all the songs that the philosophy is tight, that, that everything I say is correct. And even the lifestyle, you know, I have to make sure that I'm, if I'm representing something, I have to, to be practicing it. Yeah, or, or just being honest. And sometimes in songs, I am just honest about my struggles and stuff like that. I nearly left so many times Despite giving my life to be in line with the divine I was resigned to chilling with women and sipping wine This purification was too much for my mind it's interesting because we're in uh, London and about 20 metres from us, there's a man on a bench. He's got an amazing voice, yeah, actually. Yeah. He's really belting out some uh, melodies there. But it's kind of similar to what, what you do because you go out on the streets, you're out in busy city centres, town centres around the world and doing that. Do you see it as a form of prophetising as well, spreading the messages of the faith? Yeah. It's, it's like old school, you know, taking it to the streets, taking the knowledge, taking the news to the streets. So, yeah, I think it can be very powerful. It's quite nerve-wracking to do, but uh, I, I've enjoyed doing that. 
what kind of reaction do you get? Yeah, usually good. Interestingly enough, I got much better reactions in America when I went there. I think English people are more reserved. They kind of just look at you like, oh, someone is walking around rapping. I better not say anything. And then maybe secretly they're like, I, I want to find his Instagram, you know, but they, they never come up to you. But when I was in America, like, hey, man, I love what you're doing. What's that shirt? Like, and stuff like that. Like, they were proper, like, loving it. But in England, I didn't get any bad responses, but I just get people just literally looking at me like, oh, this is awkward. It's funny, because that's pretty much exactly what's yeah, yeah. happening with this chap now, isn't Oh, it? in America, people would be, like, joining in with him. People would be, like, clapping, going hysterical. But in England, it's like, there's someone singing over there. We... we we really like it, but we better not show that we like it. And we're not these minds, we're spirit souls, part and parcel of the divine, the sublime and eternally full of bliss and knowledge. There's no need for you to really even go to college because it's already there. But does anybody care when we're on hurry arm? The people are like, yeah, what is this weird stuff? Not understanding here's love. It's nice, should we just sit out here? It's a rare sunny day in London. So Jake and I go for a walk and we find a quiet spot in Soho Park. It's only a few hundred meters away from the Radha Krishna temple where Jake first found his faith. He told me how a chance meeting with a monk here 10 years ago changed the course of his life. I have always done music and when I was younger I was trying my best to make it in the music industry. I wanted to be famous, I was like working so hard. And um, by the age of, yeah, like 24, I had a big record deal. I was about to sign. My dreams were about to come true. I had a song with Robbie Williams on that album and an album ready to be released. Had these gigs where I was playing to the industry. And I used to perform in personas a lot of the time. I used to be supremely confident in these personas. But I can't deny that there was a little part of me that was always speaking, saying, who are you really, though? Are you these personas? You know? And it kind of coincided at that time with this big record deal in 2013 it was, that my dad also was ill. He had pancreatic cancer. And uh, for that whole year, so he kind of was diagnosed and we didn't know how long he'd have, but we knew it was like terminal, right? So that year I was just getting my big break and do doing a video with Robbie Williams at the same time, you know, hanging out with my dad, visiting him. He's getting sicker, you know, going into hospital, hospice and stuff. So that was like a really turbulent year. So when I was on stage and my dad was basically at death's door, you know, and I'm about to be released into the world with this pop star persona, that voice became a lot stronger, like, who are you? You don't know who you are. And, and it began to bother me. And I remember I had this big performance in front of the industry. And for the first time, people could tell. And my managers were like, hey, something was up with you today. Like, are you sure you still believe in it? You know, like, and I had to be honest and said, I don't know if I do, you know, like I'm dressing up in these mad outfits. I'm becoming a pop star, but I, I might be losing myself. I'm not sure. So. They said, okay, take some time to figure out who you are. And then it was interesting after my dad passed away because I was in the room when he left his body, as we say in the Hare Krishna community. When someone dies, we say they left the body, yeah. So when he passed away, I was, I was in the room in the hospice and I had like a direct perception of someone is there and then they're not. And at the time I didn't know what was happening, but it poses a lot of questions. So who really was he then? And people in the room were like, I think he's gone now. And you can feel, yeah, he's gone, but his body's there. So it, it's like quite a profound experience to think, so where's he gone, you know? So you're searching for answers. How did you then come across the Hare Krishna movement? So yeah, after my dad's death, I sprung into action in so many ways. I actually moved to Covent Garden uh, with some money I had. I thought that was to kind of live the pop star lifestyle. Well, I actually didn't realize it, it means I'm going to find the Hare Krishna temple down the road. <laughs> It's Covent Garden is probably one of the most expensive places to live in London of all places. Yeah, I lived there for six months and I lost the record deal, but I found the Hare Krishnas. Yeah, yeah. The man means mind, the truck is released. Let the waves flow over your aura and dive deep. Fly steep, straight out of this eve for a devotional explosion. If you water the creep of the beats. And one morning while I was living in Covent Garden, I wrote down, I want to explore my spiritual life for the first time. And I put the, the pen and paper down. Within an hour of writing that, I had this Bhagavad Gita in my hand. Something came to my mind. I think I want to go for lunch at one of the shops around the corner. I'd never even been there before. And just before that shop was the, the monk standing on the street. So I was guided there because of this, this, this thing I wrote down on the paper to the universe, you know. Um, yeah, so that was, that was part of the journey. So it was all, all falling into place, so, so to speak, spiritually. 
felt like a lot of synchronicity and it felt divinely arranged. Actually, on my dad's deathbed, we were playing the Beatles and the last voice he heard was George Harrison's voice as he passed away. And then I come to this temple and they say, George Harrison was a Hare Krishna. I was like, oh, I think I better, you know, come here. So are you feeling it? The sat and under and the chip. The soul is eternal, full of knowledge and bliss. The witness that sits in the heart is power. Family was quite against religion, actually, and God and things like that. Or against believing blindly anything. But when I came to, to this uh, Hare Krishna movement and met the guys here, I realized it was like a spiritual science. They never said to me, believe anything. They never said, you just have to believe this, just have blind faith, God is there, or something like that. Because I wouldn't have gone for that. They told me very profound philosophy, which was actually very scientific, that explained why we're here, who God is, so many details that I'd never heard before. And I, I felt reciprocation. Were you searching out other faith at the time? No, actually, I didn't even realize I was searching for spirituality. I was just searching and I came here. So I went from atheist to Hare Krishna. I, I never even look, looked into any other religions too much. I since have, because after, you know, having this spiritual awakening and learning so much, I started to look into so many other religions. And I realized that there's so many great stuff in all religions. I mean, religion is meant to teach you how to know God and to love God. And if your religion is doing that, then your, your religion is perfect. After immersing himself to life at the temple, it quickly became clear that Jake would find it hard to release the type of music he was doing before. It conflicted with his newfound values. The record deal was scrapped, which was a huge disappointment to many of his friends who were expecting the launch of a massive music career. Yeah, I think it was hard for some friends to understand when you make such a big change, when you're just like them a minute ago and now you're into something completely different. My mum actually was always very encouraging, which was, uh, she was even surprised by that because she was also raised an atheist. But something about how happy this was making me, something about the man it was um, turning me into, the new knowledge that I had, I think she just saw that it was good for me and she, she supported it. And then she also later on became a Hare Krishna devotee. Like After my dad's death, me and my mum both uh, became much more spiritual than we were before. The Hare Krishna movement, also known as ISKCON, was founded by Swami Prabhupada, who aged 70 began preaching in parks around New York. He arrived there from India with very little money and he managed to tap into the 60s counterculture and his following grew rapidly, soon spreading to England and further afield. The movement attracts a diverse range of people who practice in varying degrees, but as Jake tells me, the most strict stick to rigorous principles, which includes the regular chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. But to be considered a a serious practitioner, uh, you're supposed to chant at least 16 rounds a day, which takes about two hours. So it's serious stuff, you know, most Hare Krishna practitioners, if they're doing that, they'll be uh, meditating for two hours a day. And that's when you're considered, that's like the minimum kind of thing. And then there's also other lifestyle things, um, like uh, no meat eating, no intoxication, no illicit sex and no gambling. And as a young man from Walthamstow, that's what you were doing? Yeah, I mean, I always struggled, to be honest. I tried my best to keep up to that standard. I didn't really struggle with the in no intoxication because it wasn't really my thing, or gambling. I never really gambled. Or me eating, really. I, I just started having the lovely vegetarian food they cook, and I became vegetarian quite easily. But yeah, of course, as a young man, no illicit sex, which basically means no sex out of marriage, or in some, some practitioners would go as far as no sex, apart from having a baby. That's the highest standard. Of course, for a young man growing up in the West, that, that's very challenging. And 16 rounds is, for me, very challenging as well to, to chant a mantra for two hours a day when the mind is distracted and you have so many things to do in London. Yeah, so it's a challenge. I mean, when you're able to do it, it you do feel enlightened. It, it does work, uh, but it can be a real challenge. And sometimes you can feel like, yeah, you're not at that standard and it can be very tricky as well. And yeah, be hard to to keep up and hard to not start feeling bad about yourself if you can't reach that high standard, honestly, sometimes. You're listening to Heart and Soul on the BBC World Service with me, Rajiv Gupta. I'm in central London meeting the world's number one Hare Krishna rapper, Jake Emblin. One of the things that kept Jake coming back to the temple was the connection with devotional music. 
Today, Jake's invited me to join him for Harinam, which is where devotees take their music and dancing out onto the streets. Some people may have seen the Hare Krishnas in the streets walking through singing and think that's weird, but for me, it was like, what? You get to walk through the street singing and everyone looks at you and wearing weird clothes. It's like what I used to do before performing, you know. So I found it very comfortable. Yeah. As an artist, that audience, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that energy, I bet it's exhilarating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, it's not supposed to be about you. <laughs> it's not supposed to be about you. It's supposed to be about Krishna. Um, so yeah, when they sing in the streets like this, they are purifying the atmosphere by singing this mantra, taking the mantra out to the streets to raise the consciousness of London. And um, yeah, they have these ancient instruments, ancient sound vibrations to, to purify the atmosphere. And it's really fun to be involved in. Once you get over being self-conscious about it, it's actually really cool. You get in like a parallel universe walking through uh, Ox Oxford Street in London, which is so materialistic with so many shops and you're just in this like line of spiritual people. It's like, it's actually really cool. Whilst out with Jake, I could see that something was different this time around. He seemed distant and not as engaged as before. I asked him if something was wrong, and to my surprise, he dropped a bombshell, which I wasn't quite expecting. So we managed to find a room in the Radha Krishna temple in Soho, uh, which is where Jake found his faith and his, uh, his spirituality. And we come back here, it's kind of ironic because actually 10 years later, I understand that you're actually questioning the whole journey that you've been on for the last 10 years. Some people might find that shocking, like what's going on there? Yeah, first when I came here, you can dive in quite deep and that can be a really profound experience. But then at some point you go through these other phases of, am I pretending, you know? Um, I, I, I've got to get back out into the world as well and, and, and how to get th those balances. And I felt like I, I came, uh, I had this spiritual awakening because I felt like the world and the music industry was trying to tell me to be someone else all the time, be someone you're not. And I didn't feel like I belonged. Then I came here and felt like I belong here. But then after a while, I, I still had a bit of a struggle to, to still be myself here as well and to accept all the parts of me. Uh, and so I'm trying to now keep um, my faith and keep all, all the knowledge I've learned here, but also diversify, remember who I was before put all these things together and be like a, a whole person. I mean, you've spent 10 years of your life. We've spoke about how you found Krishna consciousness after your father passed away and it was something that was cathartic for you. Questioning it or changing direction now, that's a really big deal. It's, it's not really that I'm questioning Krishna consciousness or Krishna, like whether he exists or something like that. It's more just figuring out how to apply it into my life, um, whether it would be in a more traditional uh, way or in a way that's just, mm, yeah, real to me. I wonder how much of the music and your music is part of this change of direction. Yeah, I think as an artist, you have to go with the flow of creativity, you know, so I, I can't really uh, help where that goes. But I, I think my music guided me here as well because, oh great, you can put this stuff into songs. Like, you could do some really meaningful songs with this. But as you say, an artist kind of has to try and express the truth. So if I'm going through other stuff, I've got to express that too. I can't, I can't just be a persona that's, oh, I'm just the spiritual guy and everything has to be all holy and spiritual. I have to talk about what's going on and the conflicts I have. And so I'm going with that flow wherever it, it leads next. And as I said, in a quest to be more authentic, which I think art is about, so, yeah, I may bring back some of the parts who I was before. I may keep some of the parts of who I've been recently and put them all together somehow, um, and it will create something new. And, and I guess that's what art and music is about. No matter what I do, she keeps pulling me in. No matter where I go, I feel like I can't win. I'm tired. So Maya tell me what's the deal. You keep getting me to do things against my will. I can't chill. How can I ever... Yeah, we're just on Soho Street. And we were talking, Jake, and uh, Harinam Ananda, who's a monk, just walked out and you quickly said, right, he's a good yeah. guy for you to speak to. So how do you guys know each other? 
Uh, we've known each other for years. He's from Australia, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He used to do so much at Harinam, which is where we do the music in the street, and he was uh, always a big part of that, and we used to do that together, and yeah, we just become friends over the years. Yeah, um, actually, when I first saw them do chanting in the street, I didn't like them. <laughs> for they were just like white guys who were smoking ganja, trying to be Hindu, you know? But uh, then I read the books, and there's a whole philosophy behind it. Actually, it's a spiritual sound that purifies the heart and it elevates your consciousness. So, yeah, by trying that, it was nice. And the fact that they share that sound vibration for the benefit of others, um, you know, I thought I'd try it out myself. And, yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing experience, the happiness you feel making other people happy. I wonder how you feel about what Jake does in terms of rap music, which is sometimes associated with some of the the more materialistic things, some of the ills, what very much the Hare Krishna movement preaches against in many ways. Yeah, um, the thing is, it's like, what is your intention, you know, in terms of what content you're going to put out there? So, you know, he has this philosophy of Krishna consciousness, knowing that, you know, we're more than just like this fleshy dead bodies. We're actually like pure consciousness within. So. He's doing like words that help elevate. Now, Jake, you're probably at a different stage now to where you were even, say, a year, two years ago. I wonder whether you want to open up a little bit about that. I'm just, we were talking earlier how I'm continuously trying to be authentic and put all the parts of me together. I've been around this movement for 10 years almost now. And uh, at some point, I've been very much, I'm on a mission to spread Krishna consciousness through music. I'm the number one Hare Krishna rapper in the world. But I started to wonder after a while if, if that is another persona I'm playing, in a way, because I was playing personas before, trying to become famous. But you know, sometimes when you become part of a, a religion or a movement, it's like, no, you have to do that way. Give up everything and be like this now. So what's your been experience of that? What would you yeah. like say about that? Yeah, it's quite funny because like religious institution is kind of a necessary evil. You know, so it, it may not carry the same ideals that are presented in, like, by the saints and the scripture. You know, it, get, it can get, like, on the surface level, moved by what's trending. So um, even though it's a spiritual movement, people are, like, on all different levels. Obviously, those who are, like, more surrendered, they can see the bigger picture, they see the essence of what you're giving. So they won't put you in a box. But then you got people who are, like, they just take everything for face value, and then they just put you in a box. Oh, he's a Hare Krishna rapper. Obviously, you're more than that, right? So yeah, there are many parts to me. So what if I started to just do music like I used to do, or dressing up like I used to do, and suddenly doing something that seemed contradictory to this spiritual music I've been doing? What do you think you would think, or maybe even other people in the community would think of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you got some principles as a practicing Hare Krishna devotee. So. You know, if you start eating meat and stuff, you know, it's going to be, hey, bro, what the hell? <laughs> or you start drinking or, you know, you start, like, being a player. <laughs> or, you know, so that, those kind of things, it's like, yeah, you'll distance yourself, you know. Um, you'll isolate. You, can't, you couldn't really claim to be, like, a follower anymore. It's such a high, you know, high, such a high level of, like, actually claiming to membership, you know. You can't just put a label and think you're part of it. And so, yeah, obviously, that's, that will go down. So, yeah, hopefully you don't do that. <laughs> so you have to follow the lifestyle. And if you're representing it, you would have to make sure, that as a person, you're following that lifestyle uh, and not try and represent the movement if you're not fully. Yeah, man, like, you know, especially if you're walking around like, I'm the Hare Krishna rapper, yeah. you know, and then, you know, it's a whole preaching movement that we've got going on. And then you feel like... If you're not up to standard with your practice, it's going to come through your music, you know? Mm. Like, the, the, the materialistic atmosphere is going to degrade us if we're not, like, fighting back. Hearing sentiments like that are not easy for Jake. He knows by moving his music in a different direction, not only will he have to give up the title as number one Hare Krishna rapper, he also risks losing friendships and bonds that he's built over a number of years here. Are this, are they spicy, the spring rolls? Do you know if they're spicy? Huh? Jake and I have dinner at the temple's vegetarian restaurant before walking back to the place we first met 
for one final conversation. I could see on your face and in your voice, there is a little bit of a wrestle though still with certain things. It's quite difficult, it's a challenge. You're at a real point of tension in your life. Yeah, it's been going on for a while. I feel I've made progress, but it's still there. I'm still um, struggling to be myself in all situations. There's been times where I could be, I felt like I could really be myself in the spiritual community, but then I couldn't be myself with my old friends. And then there's times where I feel like, oh, now I can be myself with old friends. But then when I come back to the spiritual community, it's like, oh, I feel like awkward now again. So it's, it's just this mission of bringing them all together to, to be able to be myself in, in all circles and be comfortable. I wouldn't really blame anyone for that. I wouldn't say, it's my old friend's fault for being so materialistic or it's the Harry Krishna's fault for being, you know, so Harry Krishna. It's like, I have some issue with not being able to be comfortable being myself. And I would love, to be honest, to be able to, to move in the music industry like I used to do before, but having this spiritual understanding and be comfortable with myself, knowing who I am, but being these personas and performing. And I'd love to be able to come and hang around the Harry Krishna community and feel that I am a devotee, I am good enough, and, and, and that I also belong here and can be myself. And that's what I'm trying to get to. Say Hari Krishna Hari Bo. Yeah. Hari Krishna Hari Bo. Yo. I nearly left so many times, despite giving my life. Heart and Soul was produced and presented by me, Rajiv Gupta. This purification was too much for my mind. It's uncomfortable, but you merged with me, purging me. Nobody said this would be like open heart surgery. Your mercy's deep, so I'm deciding to be patient on this path of self-realization. Yeah.